This is a chapel service at a school of theology at a Christian university. So we all know what to expect. And we are all already primed by everything about our context here uh, for a professor like me to tell people like you certain things about a person named Jesus. And that's what's gonna happen. In fact, you even know the next thing I'm gonna say, it's gonna be, turn with me to Ephesians 4, verses 20 to 21. It's a a short passage uh, that I wanna just um, pick out and point out a few things to you in. Ephesians 4, 20 and 21. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you've heard him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now this is the word of the Lord. This is all going great so far. Why do I draw attention to our situation and to our roles within it? It's because while I was preparing this sermon, I was really getting into it. I was very enthused about this passage, but then I suddenly realized that I was about to do the most obvious, predictable, true to type thing imaginable. I'm about to tell you that according to Ephesians 4, Jesus Christ is in some ways like an academic subject that you study, you learn Christ. And that a relationship with Jesus is in some ways like having him as your teacher who you pay close attention to. Now here's the thing. It's totally true, and I'm gonna keep saying it. It's absolutely true, it says so right here. Learn Christ, hear him, be taught by him. Truth is in him, that's really how it is. But what brought me up short as I was prepping to share this with you was this jolt, just kind of one of those moments where I had a kind of -of out-of-body experience as I could look down at myself from outside of me and see me in my study, surrounded by my books, like 14 books open at one time, preparing for the moment when all these students and teachers with backpacks and briefcases would come to Christian University School of Theology chapel time, and then I would tell them, you guys, Jesus is kind of like a subject you study. Do you get how it's just a little bit too true to type? Do you ever feel like you've accidentally kind of walked into a stereotyped moment? Usually it's kind of on your side, like, look, I act like a behavior. I got a costume from the costume shop for a professor costume. But every now and then you sort of like step out of phase a little bit, like I swing by the mechanic to get the car fixed on the way home, and I realize I'm, oh, I'm way too tweety to be talking about what's wrong. So I I like try to take off the jacket and, and try to act like I'm just one of the mechanic guys with a broken car. And then I try to like find my pecking order, you know, the proper deference within that. Like who's the boss mechanic here and how do I show my throat and be humble enough to ask for help, but also no fool that you're gonna rip off. You do that and then you, you realize accidentally you're doing things that are just like, well, I need to get to my lecture at seven. Oh, did I just say lecture? Holy cow. You just I mean, you feel like you're walking into that kind of a setup. But this is exactly what you would expect me to say to you, right? I mean, I suppose down at the gym, the volleyball team is probably having a devotional meeting where the coach says, in some ways, Christianity is like a volleyball game, right? Or in the accounting department in Metzger, they're all getting together and saying, God's plan is like the perfect spreadsheet, isn't it? (laughs) There's an ancient uh, pagan poet named Xenophanes who said that people all over the world think God is like them and say what you would expect them to say about him. And if horses had churches, they would gather in them and worship the horse god who is extremely horsey, like them. So I freely admit that I'm playing to type. All I can argue is that I've got truth on my side. I'm the kind of person you would expect to say that Jesus Christ is in some ways like an academic subject that you study. And that a relationship with Jesus is in some ways like having him as your teacher, who you pay close attention to but I'm saying it because it's right here in Ephesians. I'm I'm dead serious, this is not just something you'd expect me to say, though it is. It's also very seriously the word of the Lord. Ephesians 4.20, you learned Christ. That's a good translation of a peculiar way to put something. It doesn't say you learned about Christ or you learned some things Christ said. It doesn't even say you learned how to have a personal relationship with this guy Christ. It says you learned Christ. It's a parallel construction to something like you learned Spanish or you learned algebra. By saying it this way, Paul takes this particular personal somebody, Jesus Christ, and talks about him kind of impersonally the way you would talk about a field of study or a body of knowledge or a set of skills. You learned that, you've got this, you know it, You have achieved proficiency in Jesus. You can demonstrate mastery of the topic in that you learned Christ. 
Now the normal way to talk about knowledge of somebody would not be to say that you learned them, but that you know them or got to know them, right? Hey, you know Clint Arnold? Yeah, I know him. Not, yes, I have learned Clint Arnold. But you hear the difference? Paul's not saying here, you know Jesus. Paul would also want to say that. But what he's saying is, you learned Christ. Now, why does he talk this way? Well, I think we can see two reasons right away that there's immediate value in Paul putting it the way he does. First of all, these two verses we've looked at come to us right in the middle of an ethical section and some teaching about the way the Christian life is a transformed life. To say you learned Christ is to say what a difference it makes in your everyday life that you now know something you did not previously know. If I say you've learned Spanish, that means you can speak Spanish. You're not like those people who know no entiende or no habla or, you know. That's not how you learn Spanish. You actually learn Spanish. You can hear it, you can speak it. Same with algebra. You don't have to wonder how these numbers might relate because you learned algebra. You got it, you can solve problems using it. That's the context of these verses. So let's look at some of the verses leading up to it to see more of the context. Ephesians 4.17, Paul says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But... That is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So the first reason to consider Christ as something or someone that you learn is this ethical reason. The results are in how you live. So this is so helpful, let me say it this way. Talking about Christ as something we learn is a helpful contrast to maybe the habitual way that American evangelicals often tend to talk about Christ. We evangelicals tend to use emotional, relational sorts of language for our life in Christ. It's a long tradition with some biblical warrant and it's my tradition, so these are my people. But if you're not careful, that emotional, relational way of talking can come disconnected from a transformed life. I don't know if you've heard it this way, but it can be a way of having Jesus in your heart, but only in your heart, you know what I mean? Like deep down in your feelings, in your heart of hearts, where he never makes a difference in your walk. Um, That's deep, all right, but it's deeply dysfunctional. To cure that dysfunction, consider how Paul puts it. Not so much you know him or you cultivate a relationship with him, it's you learned him. In context, you learned Christ is Paul's way of describing the shape of a life that is marked by knowledge of Jesus. Uh, That brings us to the second way that it's beneficial to talk this way. You learned Christ has this tilt toward the cognitive, uh, towards the mental, towards wisdom or intelligence or know-how. Now this is the dangerous part where of course I would say this, right? But this tilt is pervasive in Ephesians. Here in our immediate context, notice what Paul points out about the Gentile way of walking that he's exhorting them to stay out of and not go back to. It's all in the futility of their minds, a kind of intellectual meaninglessness, a loss of the whole point of what a mind is for. They are darkened in their understanding because of ignorance that is in them. Now, we are well aware, if you've read Paul's other letters, that he can look at corrupt Gentile culture and condemn it for all sorts of other sins and carnalities. He lists a few here. But mainly here, he has this tilt towards cognitive ways of putting it. Mental futility, darkened understanding, indwelling ignorance. But you, you learned Christ. And because you learned him and heard him and are taught by him, you strip off the old self and put on the new self. How? Look at verse 23 by being renewed in the spirit of your minds. We don't have time to go into how much that means, but please just notice that the hinge between stripping off the old self and putting on the new self is this renewing of the spirit of the mind. This take off and put on language is probably not so much the language of fashion as it is the language of theater. Uh, Don't put on the self that plays the old corrupt role. Instead, learn Christ, I'm tempted to say understudy Christ, and put on the self that plays the role you were created to play. 
How can this happen? By the renewing of the spirit of the mind, which changes everything. Am I allowed to give homework in chapel? I guess I can say whatever I want from up here, right? But it doesn't mean you're gonna do it. Um, but if you want some advice, uh, read through Ephesians. It takes about 20 minutes, about 154 verses. Just power right through it and underline all the times that the language takes a tilt toward the mental, towards the cognitive and the verbal. Once you see it, you'll see it. It's, it's all over the place, I promise. The eyes of your heart will be opened. A spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God will be given to you. You'll be given strength to understand, to know that which passes knowledge. Friends, it's everywhere in Ephesians. This is what Paul is driving at in this little letter. The goal of this instruction is for you not to be deceived so that you're no longer blown around by every wind of doctrine that happens to come by or other people's deceitful scheming or by your own deceitful desires which seem good but are a trick and you need to know better than to follow them. No, if you've learned Christ and heard him and been taught by him, then you are going to live a life that is different from that life which is impaired in these mental ways. Now, there's a danger, of course, that in talking about Jesus as a subject to be learned, we might drag him down to the level of schoolwork. But I'm just trying to tell you what's in Ephesians, and I don't think that Ephesians is doing that. I think instead it's exalting knowledge up to the register of salvation. Paul's saying here the highest things you can say about this mental and spiritual transformation that includes a change in how you see things because you have learned Christ. Charles Simeon, the great 19th century Cambridge preacher said, what the apostle calls learning Christ gives us the complete idea of all that a Christian needs to know. And this is Simeon who, um, one of my favorite ways that Charles Simeon would preach over the course of his 50 year ministry is he would lean forward in the pulpit and say, may I address you as dying people? Well, I I guess since you ask, but anyway, just um, he's like, may I address you now as people who need to know what there is to know in Christ. He says, the gospel is an exhibition of Jesus Christ. All that he is in himself, all that he is to us is there revealed. All the mysterious purposes of his grace, all the offices that he sustains in the work of redemption, all that he's done and suffered, all that he's now doing, all that he is going to do, all that can be known of him is in the gospel set forth. And there may we behold all the glory of the Godhead shining in his face. This then is what we have to learn. The knowledge of Christ is all and in all. Learn Christ is a comprehensive word. Christians are those who have learned him, heard him, been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Now that's my main point, and my second point is a short one. I just wanna ask when. When did the Ephesians learn Christ? I mean, we know a lot about the Christian mission to Ephesus. It features prominently in Acts and, and shows up in other places in the New Testament. We know that Paul preached there and Timothy was there and a bunch of other gifted teachers like Apollos, this mysterious man mighty in the scriptures, um, and Priscilla and Aquila who were impressed by Apollos but also had to take him aside and teach him more accurately the word of truth. So lots going on. Um, um, lots we could say about that. In Ephesians 1, Paul reminds the Gentiles in the Ephesian church of how they once did not know Christ, but heard and believed. He says, in Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 1.13, Paul kind of looking back on this moment of the Gentiles hearing the word of truth. And big picture, no matter who was on the ground in Ephesus doing the teaching and explaining, the end result was that these Ephesians learned about Christ from Christ, yeah? In Ephesians 2.17, Paul says, he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Paul's working with a Gentile Jew contrast there, just like he was in 1.13. Um, Who came and preached peace to the Gentiles and to the Jews? Christ came and preached peace, Ephesians 2.17. For through him, through Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So Jew and Gentile are united in Christ who came and preached peace in one spirit with access to the Father. Big picture, Christ preached Christ. He is the subject matter we learn and he's also the teacher who teaches it. 
Now you see why this matters. It's not denying the human agents. Paul worked hard, Apollos worked hard, Priscilla and Aquila worked hard. These agents, these emissaries, these are the ones that the risen Christ sent to proclaim and explain him. But it's insisting that in, with, and under that teaching that these people did, Jesus Christ himself teaches himself to all those who come to know him. So when Paul makes disciples, they are not primarily disciples of Paul. He would probably smack them if they said, I am a disciple of Paul, right? He kind of, kind of lays that on them. When Paul makes disciples, they are disciples of Jesus. There are no disciples once removed. There are no disciples at second or third or fourth hand. If you're a disciple of Christ, you're a disciple of Christ. God doesn't have grandchildren in this sense, right? Just children. So here's the immediacy of our little passage. Uh, That's not how you learned Christ. You learned Christ, you heard him, you were taught by him. Truth is in Jesus. I think a lot of translations back off of this a little bit and do like, you were taught in him or you learned about him or heard about him. Um, You know, there are reasons to go there with you got one shot at getting the translation right on the page, but um, I'm convinced that what Paul's doing in Ephesians 4 here is really leaning into this intimacy and that a, a superior translation to pick that up is that you Um, You learned him, you heard from him, you are taught by him. He, Christ, is the subject. He's the teacher, he's the curriculum, he's the learning outcomes, he's the, I almost said he's the learning management software, but I'm trying to stay pious here. Um, He's better than that. The whole point is this kind of instruction is not remote, but is face to face. Now the last big point that I wanna make may be something altogether too obvious, and it is certainly something that you expect to hear from somebody like me talking to people like you in a setting like this. Here it is. This learning of Jesus Christ, according to which we hear him and are taught by him, comes down to the Bible. Holy Scripture is the God-appointed means by which you and I today learn Christ and hear him and are taught by him. So it's, it's the concreteness and precision of God's words in scripture that make the difference between actual disciples taught by Jesus and people who are just sort of loosely in the Jesus fan club and have a high opinion of him. Christian history is full of people who claim to be big fans of Jesus but who didn't bother to meet him regularly in the text of scripture, to subject themselves to his actual factual teaching, to hear him and be taught by him so that they could truly know Christ. Now there is some spiritual reality to that kind of encounter with Christ, but it's all fuzzy and wonky and in great danger of degrading at every step, right? Um, What is the result of being a Jesus fan who doesn't norm that love for Jesus by constant recourse to the actual words of scripture? Instead of being transformed by Jesus Christ himself into a faithful disciple, people like this are gradually transforming Jesus into their own likeness. They only quote their favorite sayings of Jesus, and there aren't many of them. They only tell their personally preferred stories about Jesus, and those stories sort of get looser and looser as they uh, live mainly in their own faulty memory instead of the stubborn actuality of a text that keeps on being itself. A text in which Jesus continues being himself and teaching us. A text that we didn't make up. A stubborn text that we have to read and mark and note and inwardly digest. Like, this is how we are taught by Jesus and learn Christ. This sort of dangerous flexibility of someone who only lives in your memory and your opinion and your high esteem is a real danger of of being a Jesus fan. You've gotta constantly keep bringing it back to where he is found in the words of scripture. In a meditation on grief, C.S. Lewis writes about one of the most disturbing things about losing a loved one is that the further you go on living, the further you get away from them, and the more they exist only in your mind and in your memory, and become less real. They start to become less themselves, because if they were still here with us, they could argue back, they could surprise you, they could contradict your expectations, but the one in your memory never does. They always totally obey. They're sort of a thing in your mind. And Lewis is processing that in the, in the, uh, in the um, uh, context of grief, but he also applies it to spiritual realities and says when you don't have the hard particularity of the person actually there, things flip and instead of being formed by them, you form them because they are necessarily passive and confined to your own mental life. 
So it's possible to listen to a sermon like this one and agree wholeheartedly with point one, Jesus is somebody learnable, and point two, he himself teaches us directly, Um, but then to stop and let the message stay vague and hazy. But point three here is decisive. In scripture and in scripture alone, do we get to know the real Jesus rather than the fantasy Jesus? You know this fantasy Jesus guy? I mean, I hope not. He's whoever you want him to be. In fact, when I talk about the real Jesus over here and the fantasy Jesus over here, I'm not quite telling the full truth. Over here in the scripture corner, you have the real Jesus, but over here in the other corner, you don't have one fantasy Jesus, you have a whole crowd of them. One for each of us, several for some of us, custom made, designer fit to whatever we happen to enshrine in our sloppy, motivated, degenerating memory. The conflict in our minds and hearts is not real Jesus versus fantasy Jesus, but real Jesus from the Bible versus a host of fantasy Jesi. Do you know this word, Jesi? Plural of Jesus, it's not a word. There's only one Jesus. Jesi, it's a hydra-headed imaginary monster mob to avoid at all costs. How? I'm just gonna play to type here, the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. But let's put it in Ephesians terms. Ephesians 4.8, when he, the risen Jesus, ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts and he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. So you've gotta get the vision here. The risen and ascended Jesus Christ gives out gifted ministers and these gifts that he scatters around for the edification of his church are, frankly, extremely talky. They're very teachy, they are very verbal. They say things, they write things down. They write things like Ephesians, the Apostle Paul. They interpret things like Ephesians, prophetic preaching and teaching ministry in the New Testament church. They tell the good news, evangelists, they pastor and they teach. So much talking, lots of words, lots of learning. This is one of the things the Christian life is about. Now I freely admit there's more to church than learning, but there's not less. The risen Christ, our teacher and our subject matter, gives these ministers for a purpose. And here it is, Ephesians 4.13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, children in the sense of being tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness. Rather, speaking the truth, In love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. According to Ephesians 4, Jesus Christ is in some ways like an academic subject you study, and a relationship with Jesus is in some ways like having him as your teacher who you pay close attention to. And you do that learning through scripture because he does that teaching through scripture. Theologian John Webster says, scripture is to be read as what it is, a complex though unified set of texts through which the risen Christ interprets himself as the one in whom the entire economy of God's dealings with creatures has its coherence and fulfillment. He is risen, he is high above, he speaks to us now through his apostles and prophets and teachers. We are in his presence as we read about him in scripture. We read the Bible to continue learning what the risen Lord says in his self-proclamation. Well, I hope the things that I've said this morning are exactly the kinds of things you expect somebody like me to say to people like you in a place like this. I've tried to preach this passage the best I could, and for just one minute, let me preach this wall behind me. This big, huge, golden wall-sized relief sculpture, 45 panels by Danish artist Maya Lisa Engelhart, it's always here. It's a highly conspicuous background element in all of our teaching and preaching in this space. Engelhardt's wall is a very indirect representation of the resurrection of Christ. Without just making a painting of Jesus and depicting him, it signifies the empty tomb and the presence of Jesus, not confined and trapped in there, but out here and with us. High above, exalted, teaching the church, meeting us here, being the one in whose presence we read this book about him as we learn Christ. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.